Hello everybody, today we're going to discuss some endocrine diseases. But first we need to look at the process of negative feedback and how that works because we're going to talk about two diseases. One is disease of the thyroid gland, one is diabetes. So first let's look at the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. Like a lot of the endocrine hormones, they get a releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. In this case, for the thyroid hormone, it's called thyrotropin releasing hormone. It's going to enter the bloodstream for just a short period of time and go into the anterior pituitary to stimulate cells there to release thyroid stimulating hormone, which goes on to the thyroid gland to stimulate the thyroid gland to release T4 and T3, which are the thyroid hormones. T3 has three iodine atoms. T4 has four. So that's where they get those names. Hypothyroidism is where the thyroid isn't um, making enough T3 and T4. And the major cause of hypothyroidism is Hashimoto thyroiditis. And this is where you have low body heat, so there's cold intolerance, bradycardia, everything kind of slows down, so your heart rate slows down, your uh, gastrointestinal motility slows down, um, your basal metabolic rate slows down, so you'll have weight gain and fatigue. And this is a 10 to 1 ratio female to male, typically that presents itself between 30 to 50 and it's autoimmune disease where autoimmune antibodies go and destroy the thyroid tissue. And what you get in the bloodstream if you're looking at all, the, all these thyroid hormones is low T3 and T4 because these antibodies are destroying the thyroid tissue. Your body's trying to make up for it through negative feedback by cranking out thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroid releasing hormone because it realizes those levels are low, let's keep cranking this out. So another thing you can actually get is goiter. Excuse me. Goiter. And if you look at histology, so if you look at slides of the actual cells in the thyroid gland, follicular cells make this colloid and it's getting stimulated by thyroid stimulating hormone. So it's going to make more colloid and you're going to get an expansion of these follicles, which will lead to goiter, which is an enlarged thyroid gland. On the opposite extreme, we can have hyperthyroidism, which 85% of the time is caused by uh, Graves' disease, which is another autoimmune disorder. This time, the antibodies trick the TSH receptors so you have thyroid stimulating hormone receptors on the thyroid cells and this autoantibody actually binds to those receptors and mimic the TSH so you're on this in this case you're going to get hyperthyroidism which will present itself as increased beta, basal metabolic rate increased body heat so you'll have um, heat intolerance, um, nervousness, anxiety, tremor. You get a goiter because you're getting more stimulation of the thyroid tissue from um, your TSH will look low in the, in the blood, but that doesn't matter because you have this constant influx of these antibodies. So in this case, in the blood, you'll have a low TSH, low TRH, and an increased T3 and T4. And one unique hallmark sign of Graves' disease is exophthalmus, where you have bulging eyes uh, because these the, the fat tissue um, in and around the eyes accumulate fluid, and it just kind of causes the eyes to bulge out. The lateral view there, you can see the goiter, the enlarged thyroid gland there. And then in the uh, that's the the leg there in C, and another. A uh, hallmark of Graves' disease is pretibial myxedema, where you get some skin changes in the tibia, around the tibia, skin of the tibia, and some extra swelling there. 
some extra swelling in the fingers at the distal ends that can uh, present itself as club fingers. Let's move on to diabetes. So uh, there's gestational and insipidus, but let's talk about top one and top two. And with top one, it's it's not near as common as top two, but this usually happens when you're younger. Um, juveniles will have an autoimmune, another autoimmune situation where antibodies will go into the pancreas and destroy the beta cells. The beta cells make insulin. Insulin is the hormone that basically opens the gate for glucose to go into our cells. So without insulin, glucose can't get into our cells and our cells starve of the energy they need to carry out their metabolic processes. So the first picture is a healthy pancreas cranking out insulin in response to glucose in our bloodstream, typically after a meal. And then insulin will go and allow the glucose to enter the cell. But if you're type 1 diabetic, your beta cells have been destroyed, so you cannot make insulin. The glucose circulates in the bloodstream, becomes hyperglycemic, high blood glucose. And um, they can't enter the cells, so the cells are starving. And typical sign, cardinal signs for type 1 diabetes is polyuria, where you urinate a lot because all this glucose will overflow into the urine. And when it gets into those nephrons in the kidney, it'll draw a lot of water in through osmosis. And that water will follow that glucose out, and you'll become, the patients will become dehydrated, and they'll become, they'll, polydipsia is another sign. That's where you they get thirsty because their hypothalamus realizes that, you know, um, we're getting dehydrated. It's trying to, trying to combat that through um, telling the, the, patient to drink more. And then type 2 diabetes, this is quite a bit different. It happens typically later in life where obesity and a poor lifestyle, poor diet, keep eating uh, processed foods that are high glycemic. So which means that basically these receptors on our cells, it's like the boy who cried wolf. They're always hit with these high glycemic foods and this influx of glucose in the bloodstream and they just kind of quit responding and it gets to a point where insulin cannot open the gate for glucose so you, you get hyperglycemia not because you don't have enough insulin but because the cells themselves the receptors on them aren't responding to insulin to allow glucose in some major complications of diabetes and i'll tell you a story uh, there's a couple of complications, and they stem from the microvascular, like small capillaries uh, uh, disease process, and macrovascular, like our big arteries that we think about, like the coronary arteries around our heart, the carotid arteries that feed our brain. And uh, basically, with macrovascular, you get um, more lipid embedded into the, the artery lumen which narrows the arteries and when they get narrowed through this atherosclerotic process you don't get enough oxygen to the tissues especially distal tissues like the the feet and you also get neuropathy this is from more of the microvascular side where they can't feel really good they kind of have numbness so even if they have a wound in their foot they may not even know and then their retina gets involved it's called retinopathy where this microvascular damage to the the little fine capillaries that serve the retina can cause vision changes where they lose their vision so this combination is like a perfect storm for uh, losing a limb through amputation because you don't know the wounds there you're not getting blood for it to heal when there is a wound there uh, i had a patient that when i walked in to do sharp debridement or use a scalpel to cut necrotic tissue, dead tissue, out of the wounds, I promise you they had no legs, no arms. I could see their heart beating with the right angle. And I had to trim all these areas, the necrotic tissues, this brown tissue that couldn't harbor bacteria. Now, I felt like I was cutting away what very little this person had left. And, uh, but it was, it was 
the route to go because if they got infected, it would the wounds would never heal. They'd become septic. So um, we just used a sharp debris and cut cut all that away and left all the red granulation tissue, hoping that you know a miracle would happen and these these wounds could heal up. But so there's a lot of major complications that can happen with diabetes. Um, one quick note. To, di to diagnose diabetes, typically a physician will uh, do a fasting glucose where someone fast overnight comes in without eating breakfast and take their glucose level. And if it's above 120 milligrams per deciliter, that's a bad sign. They might do a hemoglobin A1C test. And if this comes back above 6.5, then most likely they're going to get a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And uh, we won't really go into the treatment here. I just wanted to introduce the pathophysiology.